So what does it mean for some series to be weakly independent? Well, mathematically, it means that the correlation between xt and xt plus h, where h is some sort of integer, must tend to zero as h tends to infinity. So that means that xt is becoming less and less correlated with its future values as we move further into the future. So what are some of the examples of weakly dependent series? Well, one of them is what we call a moving average process. So we have here that xt is equal to some error et plus theta, where theta is just some number, times some error in the last period. And it's quite easy to see here that the correlation between xt and xt minus 1 will not be equal to 0 because both of these terms are going to have et minus 1 in them. However, if we look at the correlation between xt and xt minus tau, where tau is greater than 1, we can see that this is going to be equal to 0 for the circumstance where I should probably have stated that this sort of error term here is independent and identically distributed with a value of 0 and some sort of finite variant sigma squared. So you can see that there's not going to be a correlation between xt and xt minus tau because xt minus tau doesn't share any common errors with xt. Okay, another example of a weakly dependent process is if we have an AR1 process, which is an autoregressive of order 1 process. Again, don't worry if you don't know what an autoregressive of order 1 process is, or if you don't know what an MA1 process is. We're going to devote quite a lot of time to them in the future videos, but I just wanted to bring them in now as examples of sort of classically weakly dependent series. Okay, so a AR1 process is going to be something that like xt is equal to rho times xt minus 1 plus some error et, where et is satisfying this sort of condition up here. And the idea here is that if rho is less than 1, or if the modulus of rho is less than 1, then it happens to be the case that the process is weakly dependent. And to see this, well, you can kind of see it if you think about the correlation between xt and xt minus 1, it's going to have basically a row in it, right? Because you've got a row in this above relationship here. How about the relationship between the correlation of xt and xt minus 2? What is that going to look like? Well, to see this, what we need to do is we need to back substitute in for xt minus 1, because xt minus 1 must also satisfy this relationship here. And if we do that, we get that xt is equal to rho squared times xt minus 2 plus rho times et minus 1 plus et. And to get that, I've just substituted in here for xt minus 1. So we know that xt minus 1 must, if I do that in a different colour, xt minus 1 must be equal to rho times xt minus 2 plus et minus 1. So I've just substituted in for xt minus 1 in order to get this relationship up here. So when we do this, it becomes quite clear that the covariance of xt with x, or the correlation rather of xt with xt minus 2, is going to be something involving rho squared. And if the modulus of rho is less than 1, as it is here, we have that the correlation of xt with xt minus 1 is greater in magnitude at least than the correlation of xt with xt minus 2. So again, and you can see that the, this correlation is actually going to decrease as the number of lags between xt and xt minus tau increases. So again, we have that these two conditions are, well, this one particular condition rather, is satisfied. So for the case where rho is less than 1, our AR1 process is in fact weakly dependent. Okay, what about a series which isn't weakly dependent? Well, it's actually quite similar to our sort of standard AR1 process, except now we set rho equal to 1. So we have that xt is equal to xt minus 1 plus et. And by extension, you could just write that this was equal to xt minus 2 plus some error t minus 1 plus et. 
And I hope you can see here that it's going to be the case that the correlation of xt with xt minus 1 is going to be the same as the correlation of xt with xt minus 2. Um, and in fact, this is actually going to hold exactly. So we very much don't have the circumstance where the correlation between xt and lagged values of xt decreases as the lag increases. So this particular series where rho equals 1 isn't what we call weakly dependent. It is actually what we call a random warp. And it is the sort of classical example of a series which isn't weakly dependent. OK, so why have we actually needed this assumption of weak dependence? Well, if you remember back to the sort of cross-sectional Gauss-Markov conditions, we required that we actually had a random sample of x and y. And the reason that we required that is because it allowed us to use a particular central limit theorem, the Lindbergh-Levy central limit theorem, which deals with IID observations. So we were able to use the or invoke the central limit theorem in order to do inference, at least if we had large enough samples. In time series, we've already spoken about the fact that this cannot actually be true, but we'd still like to be able to do inference. Well, the idea is that weak or weakly dependent series is, or the requirement to have weakly dependent series actually replaces this assumption of a random sample. And the reason for it is sort of replacing a random sample is because you can sort of think about if xt is not very much related to x t minus 100 or 100 lags different, then we can kind of treat xt with the sort of lagged value of xt in 100 periods time or 100 periods before as being kind of like a random sample. You can kind of think about them as being independent of one another. And because of that, we can actually invoke a, another central limit theorem which allows us to do some sort of inference, at least in the case of time series. So that's why we require that series are weakly dependent of one another. 